This is the aerodynamics of the Red Baron's airplane, the Fokker DL1. And we'll see in this video why it's arguably the most important plane after the Wright Brothers flyer. The technology in this really changed how airplanes were designed afterwards. So the most striking feature, that it has three wings, isn't the only unusual thing about this plane. For example, its tail's horizontal stabilizer is just a flat plate, which should make it almost useless. Or the fact that only the top wing has a wing flap slash aileron, or that the ailerons extend out the ends of the wings, or that the wings have this periodic ridge pattern, or the fact that this was the first fighter plane to use a thick airfoil, a Göttingen 298 airfoil. All others used very thin ones. We'll be going through all of these weird features and even very advanced aerodynamic features and explain how they even work and why they were designed that way. Some of the reasons are incredible. First of all, the quintessential three wing design. Well, actually, it has four wings because there's a tiny wing between the two wheels as well, but let's concentrate on the three main ones. So why does the Falker have three wings? The underlying reason is very intuitive. More wings means more lift, and that is true. If you have one wing and then you bolt another wing on, you'll get more lift. But there's a little more to it than that. So it really depends on how you install them. This is a cut plane through the wings and we're looking from behind. It's colored in the pressure. And the pressure is important because pressure is how wings produce lift. The idea is that you generate higher pressure underneath the wing than on top. That pressure difference then creates a force upwards. For a regular wing, the thing stopping the high pressure underneath from merging with a low pressure on top is the wing itself. But for a triplane or even a biplane, there's nothing stopping the pressure of each wing mixing in the middle. When that happens, the pressures neutralize and your wings overall begin to act less like separate wings, but really more just like one very large wing. The good news is that here, the pressures on each surface are still quite distinct. That means that the pressures haven't neutralized completely, but in this figure, which shows the velocity and the streamlines, you can see that there is definitely some mixing of fluid in each of these sections. So the pressure differences on each surface are creating a mixing effect and hence all three main wings are experiencing less lift than they could be simply because the pressures from the neighboring wings are just reducing the pressures differences of each wing. What that means is that yes, having three wings can and usually does increase the amount of lift you get, but it's not a threefold increase. So the wings become less efficient. And while in theory, three wings give more lift, in practice, designers took advantage of that benefit and made the wings smaller. That has some very important effects on the airplane's aerodynamics. The first is that the lift drops. That's usually not too bad because you're producing way more lift than you need anyway. But what's more, the wing loading increases because each square foot of the wing has to support more of the plane's weight through lift production. That directly reduces the agility of the plane. But on the other hand, because the wings are smaller now, they have a smaller second moment of inertia, which means that it's easier to turn. So there's a balancing act going on where one effect is bad for agility while the other effect is good. In this particular case, the Fokker actually had a lower wing loading than any other fighter plane at the time, and coupled with a second moment of inertia benefit, it made it very agile. Another major problem of a tri-wing design is that you now have three wings producing winged vortices, as you can see here, and hence more induced drag. And with these shorter wings, the aspect ratio is now smaller, just 4.04, and that increases the drag even more. Now I have to stress that almost everything I'm saying is looking back from a modern perspective. Back in the 1910s, the aerodynamicists didn't have access to this kind of information. And that's why even though the Fokker D01 had some undesirable effects, it still was either the best or among the best in almost every aeronautical metric. And that made it a truly great airplane of its day and one that changed airplane design forever. Now, this tri-wing design actually resulted in each wing performing very differently. NASA actually tested this plane and found that at top speed, the top wing produced 2.55 times as much lift as the bottom wing. That is for a couple of reasons, including that the bottom wing joins the fuselage. So looking at how it was bolted on, the bottom surface now is completely clean, but the top surface now has this interference from this fuselage over the top. In terms of lift, that is really bad because now you have some of your top surface, which is responsible for producing load pressure, now taken away by the fuselage. 
so this wing won't produce as much lift now. By comparison, the top wing is completely open and doesn't have any interference from the fuselage or really anything else. You can also see just how much lower the pressure is over the top wing than the other wings. The other important reason why the bottom wing performs so poorly is that it has the propeller's wake to contend with. You can see how very turbulent flow hits the bottom and middle wings. That renders that part of each wing far less efficient and effective. The top wing doesn't need to contend with any of that dirty flow. So all of these factors show how while a tri-wing plane can, and usually does, produce far more lift than a regular plane, it isn't 100% efficient. Many inefficiencies and increases in drag occur. And just quickly, this simulation was done with open foam. And if you're interested in learning open foam, then check out our courses here. Let's now move on to the wing structure. You can see that there are all these ridges from the leading edge to the trailing edge. What are they? And why are they there? Are they there for aerodynamics? Well, from a modern perspective, you could definitely argue that they are beneficial for aerodynamics and I'll explain why. So these ridges can act like little wing fences that divide the flop into compartments. During steady level flight, this is not much of a factor, but at higher angles of attack, where you start to get stall, these little ridges, while not 100% effective, will hinder the progression of stall from one compartment to another. What that means is that if one region of a wing stalls, it won't spread as easily over the rest of the wing. And I put this plane just under the bottom of the wing so we can see how the flow travels just over it. For the most part, it is straight, but the important point is at the wing tips. You can see that the last region has very curved flow. It flows outwards, but the next region inboard has much straighter flow. So that ridge is hindering the flow in the second region from curving as much as it probably would be if there was no ridge there. In terms of this plane's performance, that could very well be one reason why it was so agile. The pilots could push their plane just a little harder and not crash. But back in the day, I'm always certain that they didn't know about this effect. I mean, the idea about wing fences didn't come about until like the 1940s or so. So unless the manufacturer was incredibly advanced and didn't tell anyone about the true aerodynamic benefits of this feature, I don't think they actually knew about it. Instead, I'm quite certain that these ridges are there for structural purposes. And the reason for this is if you go back and look at the planes from around this time, including the Wright Brothers flyer, you can see that this structure inside that even protrudes out a little bit. This structure is not only there to give the wing strength, but also to preserve the airfoil profile. And that's even more important for the Fokker DL1 because it was the first fighter jet to have thick airfoils. It used the Göttingen 298 airfoil, which has a 13% thickness to cord ratio. That's about the same kind of thickness we use in passenger airliners today. Before this airplane, wings were very thin, a couple of percent thickness to cord ratio, and that's it. And the reason why plane wings were so thin back then was because the first airplanes were based on birds. Researchers noted just how thin bird wings are. If you pull the feathers off like a dead seagull, the wings are actually incredibly thin. Another good example is bat wings. We now know that they're thin for other reasons, mainly because of weight and flapping purposes. The wings we use operate on a very different principle. They don't flap. As such, a thicker wing is better. It produces more lift, and we can see that in this cup plane just how great the pressure differences are from the top surface to the bottom surface of each wing. A thicker wing can go to much higher angles of attack too, without stalling. And that is one of the reasons why this Fokker DL1 has the best climb rate up until about 12,000 feet. Now, I tried to research what was the first plane to use thick wings, and this was the earliest example I came across. If so, then this is the reason why this is the most important airplane behind the Wright Brothers flyer. I can't stress enough how big a breakthrough this was because it opened up aviation where planes were safer, more efficient, could carry greater payloads, and so on. This one difference completely altered how planes were built ever since. Thick is just better. If you know of an earlier example of a plane with thick wings, let me know in the comments below. Another benefit of having such thick wings is that you could put more structural stuff inside them. The irony is that the Fokker D01 actually had problems with structural strength, and the earlier models tended to break. And that actually brings us to another benefit of the tri-wing design, compared to either a mono-wing or a bi-wing. A tri-wing design can use smaller wings. As such, the loadings at the wing roots, so where they connect to the fuselage, are smaller. That means you don't need to use as much material to strengthen the plane, so it can be lighter. 
And that was certainly the case with the Fokker DL-1, which was one of the lightest fighter planes at the time. The lightness came with another benefit too, the thrust to weight ratio. The engine wasn't the most powerful, but because the Fokker was lighter, it had a better thrust to weight ratio than almost any other plane. So it could accelerate faster, turn better, and climb faster too. Concluding this part, the ridges here are almost certainly just for structural strength, and the potential aerodynamic benefit they gave was just a happy coincidence. Now, there's another oddity to these wings. The fact that only the top wing has a wing flap, or an aileron, depending on how you want to classify it. The wing flaps are used to change the effective geometry of the wing, so that it can become more or less cambered. As a result, the lift can either increase or decrease. For example, when you want to take off or climb, you angle the flaps down. When you want to cruise, you want to keep them more level. Ailerons are similar, but they are more outboard and they are used to help the plane roll or bank. By deflecting one side by a different amount to the other side, you create a different amount of lift on each side of the wings, and that rotates the plane around the center axis. Wing flaps and ailerons are very similar, and each one can function as the other, but generally, Wing flaps are more inboard and ailerons are more outboard. The reason why ailerons are more outboard is because that provides a greater moment arm that makes the plane roll faster. But the fact that the Fokker is using these flaps as both ailerons and wing flaps is not unusual either. The unusual thing is that only the top wing has flaps. The other two wings couldn't change camber, so their lift production was really just a function of the angle of attack of the plane and that was largely dictated by the top wing and the tail. So why didn't the bottom two wings have flaps? To understand that, I think we need to look at the tail. As I mentioned at the start of this video, the tail's horizontal stabilizer is just a flat plate. It's really bad. If you have the air hitting it at like even a small angle of attack, three degrees perhaps, the flow is going to separate and the tail will lose its ability to pitch the plane up or down. So with such a bad tail, how did the plane even manage to stay in the air? That is mostly because of the middle wing. Looking at this video, the flow over the middle wing and even the bottom and top wings to some extent are angled perfectly for the tail. If you look closely, the horizontal stabilizer is angled up too, and so perfectly, so that the air hitting it is completely in line with it. With this kind of flow, the bad tail has almost no chance of stalling. So it was actually the wings and the middle wing in particular that fed the tail with the correct flow. If you had a wing flap on the middle wing, the flow coming off it would not be at the right angle anymore and the tail would probably see a greater angle than it could handle. The top wing helps it in that too in that when the flap is tilted down, the flow will be shot down at an angle and hits the top surface of the horizontal stabilizer. This surface is the one that risks stalling. So the wing flap here actually helps keep the flow attached. Now I should mention that Fokker didn't go overboard with the flaps because you can see that the flaps only really start in line with the ends of the horizontal stabilizer. That indicates that Fokker also knew just how sensitive this area was to variable flow. That now explains why the top and middle wings are designed the way they are. But why is the bottom wing designed without flaps? That's because if the bottom wing had flaps too, when they deployed them, the flow would then be angled down more, and that will angle the flow above it more as it fills that gap, and the angle then hitting the tail will be greater and potentially stall it. So that's the aerodynamic reason I can see why the wing flaps were placed where they were. There might have been some structural reasons too. Maybe, for example, attaching all the wires were too costly or even difficult. I don't know. But there's one more detail about the wing flaps slash ailerons that is really weird. The fact that they extend past the end of the wings. There are a few benefits to doing that, but I think the benefit they were going for was that when you deploy the flap down, the front of the ends now stick up into the air. That is called a horn, or air horns, and it was very common practice in planes after this one, and even today you can still find cheaper planes with this feature. What this horn does is provide a surface for the oncoming air to crash into and push it back. That then rotates the wing flap more, and the reason why you'd want that is it makes it easier for the plane to operate the wing flap. All of these planes were physically wired, so the controls the pilot literally had, had a load on them too. To operate them required force, and the more the flaps are deployed, the more force is required to even hold them there. 
This horn produced some force to help it rotate and alleviate the strain on the pilot. And that's an even more important point when it comes to dogfights, because the greater the loading on the plane during fast turns and steep climbs, the more force is on the flaps and the more force the pilot has to use. This horn idea was cutting edge at the time too. So that's the reason why I think that they had the flaps extend out so far. But I think that there were other benefits as well that the designers didn't quite realize, mainly because it took another 20 years or so for the theory to develop. So those benefits concern the wingtip vortices. We now know that wings produce vortices at their tips. In this case, the ends of these flaps are right where the vortices are created. These flaps potentially reduce the wingtip vortices by creating a barrier for them to crash into and really get hindered. That reduces the plane's induced drag. But the induced drag and vortices weren't completely mitigated because, again, we now know that the vortices roll up over the entire cord of the wing and not just at the very ends. But that's not such a big thing here. Having the wing flap right in the vortex means that the vortex is pushing the flow down onto it. That helps keep the flow attached at higher angles of attack, angles of attack where the rest of the wings might have stalled. That's a key benefit when it comes to dogfights and safety in general. In modern planes, we abide by the principle that control surfaces should be the last thing to stall. The reason is that if you lose control of these surfaces, then you have no hope of controlling the plane. You can't recover, you can't do anything. You're literally at the mercy of whatever fortune dictates. To ensure that the control surfaces are the last to stall, we currently use a bunch of different approaches such as wing twist, where the tips are literally twisted down so that they are at a different angle of attack to the root. We also use vortex generators. We use different airfoil profiles, ones that stall at higher angles of attack. Back then, all of these approaches were way in the future. They had no idea of them. And I'm not even sure if that was a widespread practice to ensure that you kept the control surfaces controllable. I don't know. But with this particular geometry, the vortices help the pilot control the wing flaps and in turn be able to fly more aggressively than opponents. Finally, why did the tail have such a flat horizontal stabilizer? Honestly, I don't know. I mean, they had realized just how much better thick wings were. So why they didn't make the tail thicker is a mystery. I have a couple of ideas, but I'm not sure if they're right. The first one is that because thicker wings was so groundbreaking, perhaps they didn't want to rock the boat too much and they didn't have enough information about how the tail would react to having thick wings too. So they just stuck with convention here, maybe. The other reason why might be because of manufacturing costs and material. During wartime, it's hard to get anything other than bad vibes so maybe they just didn't have the resources and just decided to go with this simple and proven design instead. Or maybe they just saw pigeons had tails like this, so they must be good. As I said, I'm not sure the exact reason, and if you have any ideas why, let me know in the comments below. Finally, the fourth small wing between the wheels. Well, I think this is just a case of Fokker going lift crazy and wanting any surface that they could produce lift. Sure, it does streamline the connection between the wheels and reduce its drag, but if they really wanted to reduce the drag, they could have made the supports for the wings at least a little more aerodynamic too, because they produce a lot of drag. So with all of these features and benefits, the reason why the Fokker DL1 was such an amazing and groundbreaking airplane was partly due to good design principles and partly due to luck, where some of the things they did just all worked out together and we know now because of our aerodynamic theory has advanced to the point where we can understand these effects. And that is why the Fokker DL1 was one of the most important planes of all time.